no, I didn't want to do that. Uh, we, I, I really thought that, you know, if people could change their diets at that point in time, they could avoid the vaccines. So we didn't get the vaccine. We kept on the diet we got. We got tested positive for the coronavirus in about a year and a half. No problems. For about 60, six days in one case and eight. In those days, we kind of took a little down and we kept on working. But we, you know, no vaccines and we solved the, the virus, this coronavirus. We got the coronavirus, can't solve that. But we changed the diet, it just it, no, no problem. Let me show you a couple more things there before I leave. Uh, and this is from the first China study that we did in the early 1980s. It actually came out in the New York Times in 1990, actually. Uh, it's, uh, I want to show you a, a sort of uh, some data from that study that really uh, supports this kind of thing I'm talking about in a way. Namely, what I'm showing you here is a relationship between, this is all from that study, the heart disease study, 6,500 adults, 35, 64 years of age, and so forth, as you can see there. The heart disease rates here on the y-axis, and here's the amount of serum cholesterol. Okay, serum cholesterol. The amount of cholesterol we consume, if that's all there is, is not going to cause heart disease. That's been that's been uh, that's a, been an intentional shift of opinion. To be honest about away from the fact that the real cause is animal animal food. Uh, so anyhow, serum cholesterol is a pretty good indicator of heart disease risk, and so. Uh, at the some years ago in the 1980s, I was on a government committee at the time. We all were aware, aware of this that the range of cholesterol intake in the United States is considered to be okay, normal. It goes from 155 milligrams per deciliter, there's the terms right there, it's up to let's say 274, maybe even 300. So there's a line that has been used in the US to show the relationship between serum cholesterol and heart disease. And of course, their solution is what take a statin. Uh, which deals with the cholesterol, but doesn't deal with the disease, really. Uh, so here we got the relationship of serum cholesterol with heart disease. Uh, I want to show you what we saw in China. Really amazing. Uh, they in, in the U.S., we were saying at the time, you don't go below 150, you get down there too low, you, you, suicide rates are higher. And colon cancer rates are higher, which is really nonsense. Uh, but that was the, uh, the uh, way of saying it here in, in the United States. In China... Their low was 94. These are means, by the way, of counties are even lower. Their low was 94, the high was 62. So it turned out the line here for the US, it goes down as you decrease cholesterol, serum cholesterol, heart disease goes down, as you can see there. The China study keep, and the China population, it keeps going right, right on down. The lowest cholesterol level mean, just average of one of the counties was 88, if you can believe it. And at that point there, uh, in one of the counties at that more or less at that range, uh, only one person out of 340 some thousand deaths, I think it was in the record keep in the records, actually suffered heart disease. So heart disease is virtually not known in China as cholesterol levels for that. By the way, my friend uh, Caldwell Esselton, well, good good friends, he was at the house at the time. He was kind of looking at their stuff, and he pointed out, said, "Oh my gosh, there's only one person out of 300 some deaths here that died of heart disease." So that was the basis of the China study, <laughs> which now I didn't think it would go any place. Uh, been going this is second edition, two thousand sixteen. It's been translated to fifty foreign languages. Uh, now it's over it right around five million copies. Uh, and I, I want to make it just finish this off by a couple of things. You know, our focus on protein, animal protein in particular, has been so. So keen. I mean, it's in my mind, in our trade, and where I came from, everything else. I did my doctorate dissertation. We believe in animal protein, particularly, I say, we believe in protein, of course. It is important. It's an important nutrient. But we believe that the best is in meat. Well, in any case, way back in the 1800s, 1839 to be exact, uh, this gentleman here, Gerald Mulder, a chemist in uh, Holland, uh, discovered for the first time a chemical in meat to account for the fact that the meat was useful in keeping a dog alive. He isolated it. He got that chemical out, had to get a name for it at that time. He named it as the Greek word proteus, Greek word proteus, which means of primary importance. And so that's the baptism. That's the baptism of the word protein, come from the Greek word, right? And so ever since then, we've considered protein, meaning animal food, animal from animal food, 
I mean, animal protein. Uh, it, we tend to think of it as a prime importance, and so it's been. It's that, but that, in fact, is really what justifies more than anything, especially speaking, our our uh, production of of uh, livestock and you know, from pigs and chickens and all the rest. My background, quite frankly, uh, of, of this whole whole thing. So why? I mean, the story, the the history of this story is fascinating. And it's worth a couple of lectures. I talked about it some with my grandson in the future of nutrition. We wrote that book in 2020. Uh, you know, the, the history, you can go back and you can see why we got so confused and why we're doing the really kind of dumb things we do. Uh, and, uh, and so it, it has a, it, it impacts our whole system of medicine. I'll finish up just with this comment here. And this is kind of, this is, I'm saying a lot of, I'm giving you the shorthand version of a lot of information. So take it or leave it, but uh, here's my summary of, of things. Our practice of medicine in the West, I call it reductionism. It's all focused on one cause, having one effect, operating what one mechanism. It's one, 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 one like that. Just one item. And that we think that way because if we can identify what that what that mechanism is, or that, what, if you will, or what disease we're talking about, then they go to work and get a drug. That's where the drug comes from. The drug comes from this concept here, reductionism. And so we we invent uh, uh, chemicals. Uh, we can't use natural chemicals because we can't get patents for them. So they're, they're those natural chemicals that might look like they have a little property, a little effect, good effect in food, by the time we take them out and you know, rearrange them a little bit and, and then give them, we, that's what we use to try to treat ourselves. That is the opposite of nutrition. I call it holism in the, in the book that I had there uh, that, that was shown in the intro, I think. Uh, I call nutrition a very different, um, I'm going to say animal, I can't quite say it that way, uh, a very different concept from medicine. There are two opposites. One focus on one thing at a time. That's what causes our problems and our soaring health care costs and all the rest. Whereas whole on, this is a whole food. Eat the whole food. Eat the plant foods. It's a dramatically different, different universe. So in our current medical system, we think of one disease at a time. Each disease has its own properties, if you will. One cause, one mechanism. That's what we think about it. That's what we make a drug. When we think, oh, we're going to take the drug and we're going to target it to a certain mechanism. That I showed you in our work that I got my uh, bias from, I guess you could say, my conclusion. Namely, I was looking for the mechanism. And there was no such thing as the mechanism for the most part. And, and we use uh, these drugs that are not even natural, and they all have the side effects, and it's and it certainly a cause of death. It's horrific. This is why nutrition is not taught in medical schools. Nutrition is holist, which solve a lot of problems. Instead, we use lots of drugs. Makes a lot of money. So here we here we're making health. Here we're making wealth. That's about the that's a fundamental difference. If nutrition were taught in medical schools, there's not one medical school in the United States that teaches nutrition. Not with this concept whatsoever. So I'm sorry to say that my medical colleagues were already very fine people wanting to do their thing and so forth and so on, tend to want to think and you look at one thing at a time. Maybe using a nutrient supplement, maybe using drugs, whatever. Uh, if it were taught nutrition, we could solve our problems. All kinds of problems. This is why public is so confused about nutrition. So, as I say, I, I find some of this uh, in regards to history uh, with my grandson, Nelson Tesla, a graduate University of North Carolina, a good writer. Uh, and we tried to explain in here uh, Basically, uh, you know, where's nutrition going to go? Where's it going to go? First off, we have to understand what the word means, and then we have to teach it. We have to inform the public, and the public should not get access to this. And and the physicians themselves have almost zero. They not not only have zero knowledge, they they have a worse kind of knowledge because they tend to focus on one thing at a time, and that's not, in my mind, the way to go. It's crazy problems. So. One last thing here, my, I've got an online course, we've got an online course based on a course that I taught at Cornell for a while. It's been in existence for a while, so it's associated with Cornell, get education credits. There's a link to it. 
has been very successful and the number one online course at Cornell for many years. That's another story. Uh, but we have, we actually segregated from Cornell you know, on, on good terms. But uh, the cost of our course is too high. It's what the university required. And so we now have the same program, but for cheaper money. But more importantly, we just about finished translating the entire program into Spanish. We've got about 27, I think it was 26 or 27 uh, professionals in a Latin American countries uh, that are, you know, are, are giving lectures in the same, same material. And of course, we have the English version, the Spanish version, and now we're just in the midst of really yeah, getting in the Chinese version. We've got our friends in China uh, are very active, very, working really hard to translate our whole course in here. And together, the number of people who are English-speaking, Spanish-speaking, or Chinese-speaking names is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 2.2 billion. Uh, and we're keeping our fingers crossed. I think that uh, I am the sort of the principal speaker in, at the Lifestyle Investment Conference, uh, Congress each year in China. So it's associated with that too. So we're, we'll get a lot of uh, exposure, I think, to this. And so I'm really excited about, about the possibility that this question concerning whole food, plant-based nutrition, its time has come. They can do so much, mostly just make us healthy, keep us healthy, or reverse our sickness. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Colin. That, that was extremely informative and amazing as, as always. So, um, so how real, just real quickly for our audience, um, if people wanted to follow your work or, or I don't know if you're on any, um, social media platform, how, how would they follow your work or get in touch with you? Yeah. Interesting. I never, except one time I did it with my son, but I never went onto social media. I've never submitted a single post. Uh, I didn't want to go down that track to be honest about it. Uh, so I, I don't have a social media thing or, or a nonprofit, uh, nutritionstudies.org. Uh, they they have a, a, an outreach, quite a large outreach of people uh, that we could contact that way. Um, and uh, what can I say? Uh, so it, it goes through a you know, CN, Center for Nutrition Studies. Uh, it was put in my name, T. Colin Campbell, Center for Nutrition Studies. Uh, I think it's probably one of the best ways to do that. Uh, one, one of the things I really find excited about this whole thing, there are really quite a number of people I'm hearing, you know, like huge numbers of people who are uh, doing the one thing that do it best. Try it. Simply try it. That's about the best selling point I think you want to convey. Uh, I, I get so many replies now of people having serious diseases and trying it and reversing it. <laughs> Great. Thank them. you. Yes. And, and uh, I'm glad to hear that the price of your course went down because I'm definitely interested in taking it myself. So um, real quickly, uh, trying to put the, the book back up. Um, so if you're interested in getting uh, any of T. Con Campbell's books, you can go ahead and uh, and purchase them through the realtruthabouthealth.com bookstore. 